Hello everyone and welcome back to Amos, our course on Agile methods and open source software. This is the second section of the third part and we will look at the three main categories of software engineering processes uh, we know today, which are classic plan-driven software development, also called waterfall software development, agile methods, in particular Scrum, of course, and inner source software development. So process models are simply descriptions uh, of how to perform software development and people have been writing them down for decades now because developing software is hard and you want to communicate learnings and so you put them into a model. And these models, as we learned in the previous uh, section, can be in a very simple way described by the roles that people play, the practices they perform in these roles and the artifacts, the output they generate. And the idea here is that um, uh, as a model that gets instantiated or you behave in a certain way and if you conform to the model, certain qualities of results um, can be achieved or are given, are guaranteed by following the process properly, meaning you can get certification or you receive a certain quality, achieve a certain quality. And of course, if you do something that does not conform to the model, you are not following the process correctly any longer. And then there are no guarantees as to will you achieve certain qualities or not. And it used to be that once people realized, let's prescribe how people should go about software development, it got arbitrarily complex and eventually completely unbearable to follow. This led to some ideas about how to incrementally build uh, software, how to deal with risk, risk of failure in particular in more efficient ways. But all in all, it was rather getting more complex by the day uh, to the extent that um, at the high abstraction level that people talked about, nobody really understood much any longer what, how this related to, to the ground under your floor, under your feet. So um, we will uh, now go over four key activities uh, in software engineering mapped in some extent to the key functions from last time and because that's what the people involved do. So that would be planning, that would be carrying out the plan and that would be reviewing and releasing uh, the work. In classic terms, software development um, has a, uh, creates a life cycle for the products it creates. And so the typical life cycle is one where you have an initial incubation, meaning everything's just wild and, uh, and uh, you need to find your way. Eventually you will hit the first release and things will uh, not be so chaotic any longer and you will keep growing. Uh, you're building out the feature, it turns into a successful product and eventually it matures and there's only incremental maintenance functionality and eventually the product is uh, I will retire. So you can think about these stages or different statuses study of the product life cycle and that maybe you need different activities uh, for each phase. There would be no software engineering course without a mentioning of uh, the magic triangle and it is actually quite instructive because different software engineering processes will emphasize different aspects of it. So the magic triangle relates uh, three key properties of software engineering and states, that's the magic of it, that if you name or fix two, the third one will follow. It's actually pretty hard because um, as you can see, there are four, <laughs> uh, four different properties and one has is usually assumed a given. And so you need to understand what's behind it. So behind cost is usually the number of people or the salaries of the people in total employed on your product. 
And so we assume that this is fixed here. The product team, the software development team does not change much, and then your costs are fixed. Um, so within that, or with that as a precondition, you have scope, time, and quality. The scope is the functionality, the features you want to develop. Time is uh, by when do you want them have to be developed. And then quality is, of course, the quality, the lack of bugs, the conformance to expectations of the code being written. And so if you fix time and scope, so by end of year have these features done, this will determine quality. You can't do much about quality. Or if you say always highest quality and these features, please, then you can, uh, can then time will follow. You will be done at a certain point of time uh, and not sooner. So you can't change time. So that's the idea of the magic triangle. The classic, classic adage by uh, Brooks says that um, the reason why you assume cost as fixed is that not because it's fixed, you can add more people to the project, but it will not necessarily have the desired effect. And that is because as you add people to the project to presumably speed it up, these people have to learn and they will distract the existing people. So if you add more people to a project, you will not make it go faster. Rather, you make it come in later, at least in the short to midterm, until people have caught up. That is the, uh, uh, that was Brooks. All right, so with that, there are three main categories of software development process models called plan-driven, agile methods, and inner source. So let's look at these uh, over the course of the next slides. Plan-driven software development is by now the classic type of software development, sometimes also called waterfall style development, where waterfall really is just one, one particular method though, method though. And traditional plan-driven software development has a process uh, where you do planning, where you execute the plan, where you review and release at the end. And you do this once in that order, and that is the project or the product release. And so the implication here is that, yes, you do these activities in that order, and that may stretch over the time horizon of two years, five years even. That is the idea of plan-driven software development. You make a plan up front, and then you follow that plan, and because you planned well, Five years later, things will have played out the way you expected them to. And by thorough planning in the beginning, you were able to identify all the possible risks and failure points and address them early on. So there is no iteration here. There's a linear working through, uh, creating a plan, executing it, and... Uh, well, at least reviewing at the end whether you actually achieved the plan. And of course, that is uh, kind of uh, questionable uh, as to does this really work in reality. Here's a screenshot from a paper by Royce in which he coined the term waterfall. So he looked at plan-driven software development and he realized there are these more fine grain activities. So first you plan system requirements, then you plan software requirements, and then you perform domain analysis, and then you design your program. So that would be architecture and design, then you code it, eventually you test it, and so forth, then you put it into operations. So it's planning execution and at the end review and hopefully release. And he realized, Royce already realized um, several decades ago, I think 75 or so, um, that this idea of a linear one step after another execution does not work in practice. Royce already, who coined the term waterfall, noticed that, nope, you have to go back because during program design, 
you understand that the software requirements as written down are imprecise and you need, need to clarify things with uh, stakeholders. Or during testing, you realize that you cannot achieve certain um, non-functional properties like performance and you've got to go back to program design. So Royce already, when coining or when defining a waterfall model, um, noticed how it just does not work that easily in reality. The reaction of the engineering, software engineering world at the to all these failures then in software development was not to find a new model, but rather to double down, be even more prescriptive, be even more precise, have even more stages where you consider all the eventualities. So planning and plan-driven software development would get more fine-grained and detailed to project definition, requirements analysis, system analysis, contract negotiation, and on and on and on. And execution would be architecture and system design and user interface design and implementation and integration and multiple steps in between. And review had all these stages, etc. And at the end, it all did not really work out, rather would lead often to unhappy customers or even lawsuits. So then along came Agile and poked fun at traditional software development. Um, this is a screenshot. I'm not even sure the website is available any longer. It's kind of an in-joke, inside joke um, about, uh, say, two-phase waterfall, implementation considered harmful. Oh, well. Or take control of your team's decision now. So these are kind of jokes that you will be able to understand once we look at, um, at uh, Scrum. So why is it so hard to make a good plan and then be right about the future? Well, here are some experiences of well-known people from other domains, from physics, Prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. Haha. <laughs> From the military, uh, kein Plan überlebt die erste Feindberührung. Or Eisenhower, also military, I guess. Plans are worthless, but planning is everything. So here in that last aphorism, there is an additional grain of truth. So plans are really hard because once you have a plan, the next second, it's already out of date and it's likely to fail. But the process of planning, the process of trying to understand what's coming down uh, the drain or the pipe towards you, that is key for you to be able to react. So here is an important insight. Planning is important, not so much. So the activity is important, not so much the result. So uh, with that, I want to identify the key mistake in plan-driven software development, which was to equate the activities, the different things you have to do in software development, like writing down a requirement or implementing a test, to equate these activities with phases, where phases are supposed to be followed one after another and in a particular order and excluding each other. You are in one phase and one phase only. While activities is something that you can start and stop, can do multiple and parallel and so forth. And um, that gave rise to agile methods to realize that just having say three phases, planning, execution and review carried out once after another may not be the right thing. But the activities we learned and that software engineering defined how to program well, how to test well, how to write down requirements, they are all still usable. They just need to be ordered and applied differently from a simple, single-minded, one phase after another model. So that's Agile Methods. So, Agile Methods. Let me show you a little uh, video here to give you an idea of, uh, of what that could be about. So this person here is a Bavarian inventor. 
and he invented a particular type of rubber that he molded into this wetsuit that he is wearing and it's frictionless so uh, it can glide without friction and he's going to demonstrate to us how that uh, works. He doesn't say much, he just says Bakamas. What? what? Convenient. Good gemacht. Oh, good gemacht. All right. Bakmas. There you go. I guess that uh, person's going to be rich. That is a material, clearly no or limited friction, and he was able to plan out his, uh, his flying curve precisely. Yeah. Do you believe that? Well, uh, it turned out Mega Woosh was uh, just an advertisement, so this did not really happen like this in practice, and this material doesn't exist. And quite frankly, uh, a person would have been crazy to do that. Uh, there is not enough predictability for this. Um, already the, uh, the ramp, um, there's a making of Mega Woosh uh, video which shows how already five meter down the ramp he is off the ramp because uh, little unevenness in the uh, material laid out there will make him go out of uh, uh, loose track, go off the ramp. So this was a plan supposedly that could be carried out perfectly, but it's so dangerous. And so many basic things could go wrong, like just being just a gust of wind could get him off course a millimeter or a centimeter on the ramp and it would have expanded to hitting not hitting uh, the little water pool at the end so really nope that's not how it works that's not reality so uh, in response to this insight that your plans will get derailed by small events with large consequences later down the road uh, this inside led to agile methods, which are on the one hand like waterfall, they do use the same activities, but they line them up in iterations, one after another. In the 90s, this was all the hype, and there were multiple types of agile methods, hence I call it a category here, with Scrum being probably, well, most certainly today, the leading version of an agile methods. But there were, there were others. Extreme programming, which we will mostly use for its engineering practices, also has, a, has, a, uh, has process practices and there are more. So from this upla around, around let's have a better process because waterfall style plan driven software development fails, fails too easily, came the inside, we want agile methods where we recognize the weaknesses of traditional software development, but complement it um, with better insight, better tools. And they came up with the so-called Agile Manifesto, which pretty smartly, pretty nicely summarizes how Agile methods are different from plan-driven software development. So the key here is that the focus is not on de-skilling people, but rather giving people power individuals and interactions over processes and tools. That the focus should be on working software that you demonstrate where you can learn from living software over leaving it to the imagination of people to derive something from written text documentation. 
also to collaborate with the customer and garner their feedback as opposed to having a one-shot contract negotiation, not talking to your customers for two years and then probably be disappointed at the end. And then as you collaborate, you learn how the world is changing. So you respond to that change rather than strictly following a plan laid out a long time ago. And um, again, this means you trust your people rather than you try to control them and you get their smarts out to get the best for the software development process. You use working software to gather feedback rather than letting people read documentation where everyone will see something differently. Uh, that working software and the feedback you gather lets you steer so you will respond uh, to change um, here and that's why you show customers or users the software and so you can learn um, what really needs changing and do not slavishly follow an outdated plan and again for that for that responding to change you need to talk with your customers so you collaborate them you sometimes even bring them on board of a project to make sure their domain knowledge is represented and you get the feedback that you can use to steer the project and so forth so as a result agile software development decided to structure the overall process into short iterations sometimes called time boxes and in scrum they are called sprints so iteration time box sprints these are synonyms and these Iterations were designed so that they would lead to defined intervention points for customers, usually during review. So the software development team would be doing its thing, following a plan that it set out in the beginning of an iteration, carry it out and then gather feedback in a review. But rather than wait five years to get feedback for the first time, that iteration would be much shorter, like one week in the Amos project or maybe two or four weeks in industry. So after a rather short period of time, you will already get feedback and that feedback will be used in the next planning session of the follow on iteration to steer the project in the right direction. And you rinse and repeat one iteration after another, gathering feedback one iteration after another. So um, these short iterations, as opposed to having a five-year time horizon, have some benefits. The most important one, so there are multiple benefits, and one important one is that because you will face your customers soon, and not just in five years, you will focus on showing value and progress. So you focus on business uh, as opposed to well, let's have this really nice architecture and do lots of infrastructure and to the functionality that the user or customer wants. We'll get to that later. No, in Agile, you focus on business value first and hence you will have something to show. That rhythm you establish using these iterations will lead to a repeatable and burnout avoiding work rhythm. So it's usually much more sustainable than the classic plan-driven software development where for the longest time you'd be calmly going about your work, but then would crunch time hit you. And finally, the key thing about these iterations is, of course, that you gather feedback for risk management, that you always have something. So the customer hopefully is happy and sees progress towards his goal. So you create also... Um, agreement and trust and uh, that partial functionality you generate of course is uh, better than being quiet and so forth so you close that feedback loop for steering for making sure you're relevant for making sure problems surface quickly you can see this here visualized how it plays out in plan driven software development on the left at time point uh, at T1, uh, you are in status or uh, state one, 
and then you aim for for where you're supposed to be in t1 and you go there after five time units so you're at s5 now you were you are where you were supposed to, to be at time t1 but life has moved on uh, your goal is actually at t5 now and you're far away from t5 if you're in t1 if you follow the plan driven process where, the, where there was no intermediate adjustment possible in agile methods if you were to take this in increments and in steps you can adjust your course and you can see how you get to stage two and you see how your goal posts have moved so you change direction a little and you can see how you're very close to where you're supposed to be at t5 by state five on the right here in agile methods so that incremental orienting yourself towards a changing goal Will, make you, will allow you to track that goal much more nicely and be on target. And then again, plan-driven software development makes life easy in the beginning of a long cycle and really hard as you realize after a while, oh, we've got to, we are behind, we've got to do all that work and you're running into crunch time near the deadline. In Agile methods, you have these much shorter iterations where you have to deliver something. So maybe there's a little bit of slacking off too and then a little bit of crunch time, but not nearly as bad as in plan-driven development because you have these much shorter iterations and the sustainable, sustained work rhythm. As a consequence, and sometimes people don't quite believe that, but this pattern of continuously delivering in increment software to customers makes agile software development much more high discipline than plan driven software development. People used to say that, oh, because they don't plan so much, they are not disciplined. Quite the opposite is the case. Agile methods put people into a corset or in a strictly defined work rhythm, which if you will, uh, is much more high discipline than plan-driven software development is. Which is not to say that um, uh, Agile methods don't have their challenges. For one, uh, scaling up is hard. Um, without a plan of how to scale up, um, people will still have to coordinate. And um, Agile doesn't tell you much yet about software architecture. There's really no planning for software architecture. As a consequence, there's supposed to be an emergent architecture, uh, which will uh, uh, which supposed to be good and sustainable and so forth. Really, Agile methods and Scrum in particular drive the software development from business value creating features. So at any point of time, the next step to be taken is let's implement a feature that has business value and a developer will therefore touch uh, the user interface, maybe the domain model and even the database. So a feature crosses all technical layers. And in some sense, that's good because business value is being generated. At the same time, the architecture might degenerate because, hey, you just focus on your feature and don't look left and right. So to have a nice architecture that's sustainable, and that of course would also be a goal of Agile, you need to also look across features within one application, possibly look across features about, across multiple applications, because in a company, there are often similar products being developed, um, in a bank, for example, you'll have software for um, corporate customers, there will be a loan department, there will just be general banking uh, for them and so forth. They all want a similar user interface, there's a corporate identity to be uphold, they all want the same definition of what a customer uh, is or what an interest rate is and so forth. So you have cross-cutting technical domain concerns that complement the business value focus of Agile methods. And Agile doesn't say anything about it. So as you try to scale from one feature to multiple within one application, you will already have the feature implementations go out of sync if you don't watch out. And as you go across applications, they will even more go out of sync if you don't 
connect developers and make them coordinate work across features as opposed to in the single feature implementation. And because that is a pertinent topic, we have uh, in companies we find yet another way of developing software called inner source. And inner source is the use of open source best practices taken from the open source software development world for film internal software development. So um, inner source takes the best of open source in terms of practices, not in terms of the licenses, just the development practices, and implies that, applies them inside the company. And that's quite the challenge. So first of all, there's a lot of promise because open source promises higher quality and so forth. But it's also a challenge because open source software development is very different from how companies think about their work. And so when we looked across how open source software development works. We found that it follows these three principles which are quite different from how companies traditionally work. So in a traditional work setting, you have your hierarchy of uh, people with bosses and sub subordinate people where you get assigned to a project. And then you are inside that project or inside that organization and it's a silo. Uh, you are not looking left and right, you are working on your project. That's quite different in open source and inner source because in open source and inner source, all code, all projects is visible and not hidden. So you need to take extra measures to make that possible. And then each project or product is willing to accept contributions if people only come and want to contribute. In traditional so rather than because uh, this is best um, then you will lose people so you really have to discuss things to the end finally in open source and inner source um, people choose what they work on, want to work on and uh, as opposed to the traditional work where you get assigned tasks so agile methods and inner source work quite nicely uh, next to each other in large companies in small companies, um, in a source is kind of invisible because it's just a given, because there are no silos really inside which people hide. Uh, but in large companies, you have an escalating level of complexity and size where for a single project or product where you have people assigned to it, you will have the developers assigned to it, perform the feature work. But at the same time, they will be drawing on shared libraries across products, across the company, and that is inner source. So inner source gives you these products, the reusable libraries, not the, fun not the features itself, but the functionality that the features are built from across the various products. And so Agile Methods has people assigned to jobs inside silos. Then you use inner source to collaborate across the silo boundaries and organizational boundaries still within the company. And then, of course, if you go one step further and leave the company, you will meet open source projects and so forth. The decision, uh, what goes where, is simple. Agile Methods, that's functionality specific to your project. Inner source is functionality that is specific to your company and that's considered competitively differentiating. You're selling your products because you have that functionality and nobody else. As soon as this code or the functionality implemented by some code is not competitively differentiating any longer, it should be open source and then it leaves the company. So with that, we have identified and discussed uh, three different types of software development uh, methods, uh, plan-driven software development, agile methods, and inner source. And you can see how along these two dimensions, 
how speedily do you need to be able to react to change and how quickly do you need to be able to scale uh, these different methods have different st strength agile methods doesn't scale well but you can but it's good in terms of reacting to change plan driven scales well but it's not so great when it comes to quickly changing and in a source and open source is actually a good way of having both in class let's look at some uh, quiz questions you can see here uh, and you can identify which types of processes work well for which type of uh, project with that today or in this section we looked at plan driven methods agile methods and inner source